رجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحسي نعماه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء وخاتم المرسلين وشفي المضنبين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهر المعصومين واللانة الدائمة الباقية لعدائهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم وجعل منهم أئمة يهدون بأمرنا صلوات بنا يبارا يا الله سبحانه وتعالى bless you all for celebrating the Viladat of our 11th Imam, Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salatu wa salam. Our Imam basically lived in a time which was very crucial in Shia history. This is just before the beginning of the Ghaybat. And one of his fundamental task was to prepare the community for the era of Ghaybat. This was something which started earlier during the days of the 10th Imam, continued during the time of the 11th Imam, so that people would be ready to deal with a situation where they don't have access to the Imam directly. The, the life of the Imam was in a way short. Uh, he lived only for 28 uh, years, and out of those 28 years, the last six years was the time of his imamat. But this is a very crucial uh, time, and just to give you an idea, when you hear about the four naibin, nawab arba of the ghaybat sughra the special deputies of the 12th imam, the first of them actually was the wakil of the 10th imam. And he, he was reappointed in that position by the 11th imam, that's how he end, ends up as the first special deputy of the 12th Imam during Ghaybat al Kubra. So that's where you see the connection that the 10th and the 11th Imam prepared the community for the time where they will have no more access directly to their Imam. When we look at this source of guidance, how they guided the people, we see the history uh, of all religions. Basically, there were two sources. One is in form of revelation. Allah, you know, revealed to Torah to Musa, Injil to Isa, and Quran to our, our own prophet. But besides the revelation, you know, the prophets themselves were also the source of guidance. You know, this is where we see this concept of Quran and the Sunnah. Quran is the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Sunnah is basically the example of the Prophet. And from the Shi'i perspective, when we talk about the Sunnah, we believe that the Imams were the extension of the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now what does the word Sunnah mean? When we say the Sunnah of the Prophet, or the sunnah of the imam in extension to the prophet. Basically there were three ways by which the sunnah materializes. One is known as hadith. The verbal, uh, the, the statements of the ma'asum. Whatever the prophet said, um, you know, his statement becomes hadith. The other form of sunnah was the action of the ma'asum. If the Prophet does something without even saying about it or without even writing it down, his action itself, you know, is an indication that what he's doing is, is right. Not only right, it is something which is recommended, if not wajib. And the third form of sunnah is known as taqreer. Taqreer means something which is done in the presence of the ma'asum, and the ma'asum does not forbid that. And of course, we have to look at the context. If, it, if this was done 
where he had the ability to object to that. And still he doesn't do that. His silence, silence of a masoom itself, becomes a proof that that action is okay. So if somebody does something in the presence of the Prophet or the Imam, and they have the ability to object to this or forbid it, and they don't do that, their silence itself, known as taqreer in, in, in the uh, special terminologies in fiqh, uh, taqreer becomes a basis of the sunnah of the masoom. Now when we talk about hadith, hadith basically came in two forms. Either the masoom will speak verbally, verbal communication, or sometimes the hadith would come in written form. We have from Amir al muminin many letters for example, or uh, from other imams. But you will see that this tradition of written communication from the imam to the followers became more prominent during the later times. During the days of the 10th imam and 11th imam and of course the Ghaybat al-Sughra. When you look at the biography of um, our 11th imam, you will see that one of the... Ma- the uh, famous methods that he used to communicate with his followers and guide them in many issues was actually through written communications. The letters and some of the historians actually have been able to uh, preserve it. Of course, not in the original form, but the wordings exactly from beginning to the end. Where the imam is, has written a letter to people, uh, the Shias in Qum for example or prominent ulama uh, in different cities, or sometimes, you know, the communications have gone to the leaders of the communities in various cities, where Imam had sent his wakala and his uh, representatives. Um, a very famous writer of these days, Baqir Sharif al-Qarashi, with written biographies of the uh, 12 Imams, he actually has uh, put together uh, 10 to 11 uh, letters of the Imam written to various Shia communities uh, in Iraq and Iran, and especially some of the prominent figures of those days, including the, the father of uh, Sheikh Saduq. For this mahfil, what I would like to do is just go through um, some of the question answers which came in written form. And what I have selected is actually three of them from uh, one single individual of the uh, companion of the Imam who was very prominent. His name was Muhammad bin Hassan al Safar. He was also a writer. Uh, he has books where he has collected the hadith of the Imams. And Sheikh Saduq, in his book of hadith, has actually um, quoted some of these question answers between Muhammad bin Hassan al Safar and the 11th Imam. And in all these places, Sheikh Saduq says that I have with me the actual writing of the Imam in response to the uh, question sent by Muhammad bin Hassan al Safar. Unfortunately, it didn't, you know, last till our time. But Sheikh Saduq, when he uh, quoted this in his book, basically he says, I myself possess those letters with the handwriting of Imam al Hassan Askari alayhi salatu was salam. Three questions are selected um, based on the themes which would be, inshallah, relevant to us. The first is where Muhammad bin Hassan al Safar is asking the Imam, Fi rajulin mata wa alayhi qadao min shahri Ramadan, ashra ayyam, walahu waliyan, hal yajuz lahu man yakzi anhu jami'an, khamsa ayyam ahadul waliyain, wa khamsa ayyam al ukhar, al akhar. He puts a question that a person died. And he had 10 uh, fast of Ramadan, which he had done qaza, and he was not able to make it up. And he has two uh, heirs. Is it wajib on both of them to do the fulfillment of that qaza fast of the father? Uh, that one of them does five days, and the other son, for example, does the other five days? An Imam responds to him by saying, يَقْضِيُ عَنْهُ أَكْبَرُ وَلِيَّيْهِ أَشْرَ عَيَّامْ وِلَاءً إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهِ 
Imam says, out of these two heirs, the two sons, for example, the older one has the duty uh, to fulfill this missed fast of his father. So it's not something to be divided by him, rather it's his responsibility to do all ten of them. Let me talk about this issue, you know, best with the barakat of this hadith of the imam, uh, about the responsibility of the older son when the father passes away. One of the things that we, we know it's there in the books, in the Rasail, in the, in, in the Rasala Amaliyah, but something which we don't talk that much. And I thought maybe this would be, with the blessing of this hadith, an opportunity to know more about it. You know, in, in, the, in the Sharia, if a person, the father, for example, dies, it is wajib on the oldest son, the oldest surviving son, to do the qaza, namaz, and roza of the father, which he was not able to make up because of, and he missed it because of an excuse. Maybe illness. You know, many times you see people uh, have become very ill. They are in hospital for a month or so. They were not in a condition where they could do the namaz, for example. Um, and then they pass away. Those days that they could do the namaz and they didn't do it. It is wajib on the oldest son to do the qaza. The main point is that the namaz which the father missed, best on an excuse. You know, otherwise, to be an older son would be a problem. I mean, suppose if somebody has a father who was absolutely, you know, not practicing at all. So his whole life he didn't do namaz. To expect the older son to do all the, his lifetime qaza would be unjust. So the issue is of not ag negligence. If the father did not do the namaz and the roza because of an excuse, then those namaz which he has you know, missed becomes a wajib on the survival, uh, surviving oldest son. What about the mother? It is not wajib on him to do the qaza namaz of the mother or the uh, qaza fast of the mother, although it is recommended to do that. But the obligation is not there. And I know this will question will come out, why? Even my wife was asking that. You know, and I, the, the response is that maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to judge the mothers more easily than the fathers. They are going to be in more trouble. So probably, you know, this uh, issue has been mentioned more about them and not the uh, mothers. The obligation is only on the surviving oldest son, who is known as a wali of the deceased. It is not wajib on the other sons. And also it is not wajib on the daughters. Even if the eldest child is a female child, it's not wajib on them or on her. It is wajib only on the surviving oldest son. The obligation that he has, either he does the qaza by himself, or he has the option of getting, hiring somebody to do the qaza namaz. There are many people, many pious people who are also needy. You know, some of them do this. You know, they would uh, do the qaza uh, namaz and roza, and this is known as namaz ijara. Means they, they are hired to do that on behalf of the deceased. Now, as I mentioned this point, let me just say it again here just to a person who was neg neglectful. We are not talking about that kind of a father. We are talk talking about a father who missed the prayers and the fasting because of a, you know, a good reason or an excuse. When it comes to the other children, I get this question many times. I feel like doing it for my father or the mother. And I'm not the oldest son. Well, the issue is that the obligation and the wujub is on the oldest son. 
Nowhere does it say that others cannot do it on their own. We are talking about what is wajib or what is not wajib. There we say it's only the oldest son who has this duty to make sure he himself does it or it's done by somebody else. It doesn't prevent other children if they feel, you know, that they would like to, as a out of courtesy to their deceased parents, do namaz for them. There is nothing which prevents them. Not only, you know, other children. Actually, it doesn't even prevent a stranger to do that. You know, somebody was a friend and he says, okay, today I feel like doing uh, one day's qaza namaz for my friend. There is nothing in the sharia which says he cannot do it. You know, of course, it's not namaz ijara because he's not been paid for it. He's not hired for it. But he's doing tabarru'an. Voluntarily, he's doing it. So if a stranger can do it, of course, other children can do it, whether they are sons or daughters. So here, the issue is only about the oldest son has the obligation where the others don't have it. Salawat wa rahmatullahi wa Amir al-Mu'mineen in one of the khutbahs in Sifin, when he talks about the issue of rights, huquq in Islam, haq, he makes it very clear that there will not be a single situation where one person has a haq, a right for himself, and doesn't have a corresponding duty on the other side. So when we talk about rights, it's always two-sided coin. On one side is haq, other side is the farz. This is your right, on the other side there is the duty. Now on this issue, what happens? You know, the oldest surviving son has a little bit of an advantage, not that much, to other sons when it comes to the issue of inheritance. The rings of the father, which he was normally wearing, goes to the oldest son. It's not to be distributed among others. The personal Qur'an of the father goes to the oldest son. And even, you know, personal books and things like that. The rest is then distributed among the heirs. And so, on one hand, you see that the oldest son gets some, you know, privilege. Well, you can't just have privilege. You also have a burden at the end. And that's where we see that, okay, you know, you get this. In return, there is an obligation which others don't have, and you have it. And that is that if your father had missed namaz and rosa, based on an excuse, it is wajib on you to fulfill on his behalf. Salawat from the Second question answered from this uh, question sent in written form from Muhammad bin Hassan al-Safar to our 11th Imam. Where he's talking about the, the idda uh, period, the time. في امراة مات عنها زوجها وهي في عدة منه وهي محتاجة لا تجد من ينفق عليها وهي تعمل للناس هل يجوز لها أن تخرج وتعمل وتبيت عن منزلها للعمل؟ He's saying the situation is that a person dies and leaves a widow. She has nobody else to take care of her. She depends on her own work. Now as a widow, she has to observe idda, the waiting period as it's called, from the day of death till 40 days, of uh, four months, not 40 days. Four months, that is the idda uh, after death of the husband. And during that time, normally the situation, especially in a Muslim uh, you know, uh, community, is that she doesn't go out. Now the question is that you have a situation where she's all alone. She doesn't have anyone to support her. And she actually works for others. And that is how she is sustaining herself. Now what does she do? Is she allowed, is she allowed to leave her home during the Idda time? Imam wrote the answer, لا بعث بذلك إنشاء الله. There is no problem in her going out of her house to do her work in order to sustain herself. 
Because when we look at the, the rulings in our fiqh, what we are told is that during that time of grieving, when a widow is going through that grief period after losing the husband, the main thing is that she is not allowed to uh, display any, you know, uh, what you call beauty. So use of cosmetics is not allowed at that time for the four, four months. Uh, use of extra jewelry, whatever she normally wears, that's okay. What is normal is normal. But you know, if they are going for wedding, for example, they would put some extra things on them. Those things are forbidden. So any cosmetics or use of jewelry by a widow for, ten, uh, for four months from uh, death uh, is not allowed. And also socializing, especially in happy occasions. She has to refrain from it because it doesn't go with the process of grieving uh, for the husband's death. But other than that, to go out, out of necessity, to work d during that time, would not be a problem from the Sharia point of view, as we see the answer from Imam Hassan Askari, alayhi salatu was salam. Salawat. <laughs> or even traveling out of town for ziyarat, or sometimes they feel like going to, you know, their own parents' home, or some other relatives. Uh, so they can go through that process of, you know, uh, the grief. Um, so even if it's a journey because of not a socializing event, then there should not be a problem from the Sharia point of view for a widow uh, during the Idda time. Ekbar or salawat. The third question that I have here from Muhammad bin Hassan al Safar, written to the 11th Imam, is about a person who made a will. Rajulun awsa bi thuls malihi fi mawalihi wa mawaliyatihi. It says that a person died and he wrote a will about the one third of his estate. And he is living sons and daughters. When it comes to that one third, and he has said that. Is not specified. He says the one third goes to my children. Do we divide that one third among the boys and the girls equally? Or do we go by the two third criteria? Where the division is that the sons get double of the share of the daughters. And Imam responds to that by saying, جَائِزٌ لِلْمَيِّتْ مَا عَوْصَ بِهِ عَلَى مَا عَوْصَ بِهِ إِنشَاءَ Imam says that the mayyid, the deceased, had absolute right in, in his one-third, and it will be divided equally among the boys on the, and the girls in his family. Now, what we know then, and we have talked about, you know, whenever, whenever we had uh, will-making seminars, that in Islam, what is the relationship between a person and his estate? When you are alive, you have absolute right in whatever you own. What happens to you and your property, your estate, after death? The way of dealing with that is by writing a will. Interestingly, in Islam, the term wasiyat and will only applies to one third. In two thirds, we really don't have any right. The two thirds has to be distributed according to the shares assigned to the heirs in the Qur'an itself. But in one third Islam says that you have a right to make a will and to say whatever you want to do. Whether you want to give it to your family member, you want to give it to your relatives, or your friends, or you want to give it to 9,000 bathers, or you want to give even to somebody else. You know, it doesn't have to be Muslim. Doesn't matter at all. And so in one third you have been given absolute right to do whatever you want. But in two third Islam says that has to be distributed among your heirs according to the shares specified in the Quran. And so this is what the question is that we know that the two third system is such that when we talk about the children, you know, the males get double of the share of the female. 
And so the question is that when this person made a wasiyat that one third of mine also goes to my children, um, how do we divide? Imam says, you know, you just do it the way he has written it. Because he had absolute right in whatever he wanted to do with his one third. Salawat from Akbar. What we see is when we talk about Islam, Islam is basically a complete way of life for us. You know, there is nothing which is uh, left out. Whether we talk about namaz, we talk about roza, rituals are just one part of it. You know, and this, this is the, the important pa- part where, as I said this many, many times, you know, non-Muslims come into our, our faith because they like this aspect of Islam, that it doesn't leave us alone. Whatever we do, you know, even if you go to washroom, Islam is with you. Huh? Whatever you do in your life, Islam is with you, is saying this is right, this is wrong, this is how you should do, this is, you know, recommended, this is disliked. Um, and so when we look at even these questions, and we are talking about now almost 250 years after uh, the beginning of Islam. And these questions were very relevant. And our 11th Imam basically made it very clear that when it comes to the, these issues, we have to uh, believe in it. And we have to try our best to you know, implement the Islamic laws, at least when it comes to the areas where the government of this land is allowing us to do that. Sometimes you hear these stories, you know, uh, in America, where a rich person died and left the whole, you know, uh, millions of dollars to be taken care of their dog or cat or whatever. You know, they have their absolute right to do whatever they want. And we also can exercise that. I think although in Islam it is not wajib to make, uh, to write a will, but considering the situation that we have in this part of the world, it becomes, on a secondary basis, it becomes wajib. Because the law of the land is not preventing you from doing that. And if something happens, and the authorities come in, they will make their own judgments. You know, your, your family members will end up getting more or less than the share which the Qur'an has uh, given to them. Things become ghasbi then. And so this, this is a serious issue, you know, we didn't really much think about it in the East, uh, when we were in the East, especially in Muslim countries. Even if you go to India, for example, now. And if a Muslim, as a Shia family has a dispute in the matters of inheritance, they go to the Indian court. Even the Indian Hindu judge, for example, will make the judgment according to the Ja'far fiqh. Because in India, Muslims have been guaranteed what is known as you know, Muslim personal law. So whenever the matters of divorce, marriage, divorce, and inheritance even goes to the civil court, it is to be decided according to the mazhab that they follow. So with Hindus, will, they do deal with Hindu laws. With uh, Muslims, they deal with uh, Muslim laws. And that's why you will see that, you know, the, the lawyers in India, even if they are not non-Muslim, when it comes to personal laws, they even learn uh, the laws of inheritance of the Muslim fiqh. Because they might need that in the, in the profession, or especially if they end up becoming the judge. Salawat from Akbarah. And so when, uh, when we look at this issue, especially the one-third, um, you know, let me talk about the situation of our community. If you look at East Africa, if you look at India and Indian, Pakistan, and even in the Middle East, Iran and Iraq, you will see religious institutions do not only survive on donations, because there is a limit to what people can give. There is a limit how much you give can go to the same people again and again and again. You know, they'll look at you, look at you from far and they will say, okay, let's change our direction because he's coming to ask for money. Even though he's not coming for himself. There is something known as endowment. There is something known as waqf in our system. 
You go to this, you know, villages in India and Pakistan, for example, or Middle East, you will see they have masjid, and there is, you know, a couple of shops on both sides, outside. Why? The whole idea was that, okay, we are building a, building a mosque, but how is it going to be sustained or maintained? So they have, you know, two shops on one side, two on the other side, and from the rental income they are able to, uh, you know, maintain the masjid. Now, whether it's being maintained properly or not, that's another story. But the system is there. You know, in Dar es Salaam, the Jamaat has so many properties. They get, you know, rental in income and that's how they're able to do so many things. And we have probably reached to the level where we should, we should be thinking on those lines. You know, I talked about it previously. In Friday khutbas, the only institution in Toronto which has really taken that idea is a Saudi school. Where they started foundation uh, fund, basically to have something where they can then have income generated uh, with that project. But that is actually not a new way. We are actually going back to basics. When we talk about one third, you know, this is one of the ways that if you have the ability when you're writing your, your will, you know, you can dedicate a portion of one third, you know, for what is known as charity purpose. And it is for you to, of course, uh, select the, uh, the charities that you want. But this is one way where you get your akhirah also. Of course, you should not forget your relatives in that one third, those who are not getting anything from your estate, uh, but you know they are in, in need. And so if you look at the system that we have, even in the one third system of inheritance, you know, there is a lot of room, and especially when we talk about our own projects. Salawat Pranayak You know, Sadiq has one more other, uh, you know, interesting uh, project, which is of life uh, insurance policy. There are so many ways that you even get uh, tax uh, deduction uh, receipt for it, for the premium that you're paying. And at the end, you are gone, but, you know, your name is there, helping the education institution, for example. These are the things that we have to think about, because... On a long-term basis, when you look at community projects, you know, the way to sustain is by having, you know, in place things where, where you can have generation of income to maintain our own center. Salawat بلکہ ریٹن جو کوئیسٹنز امام سے پوچھے گئے تھے اس کے بارے میں ہم نے دو تین باتیں سلیکٹ کی تھی جو آپ کے سامنے ہم نے پیش کیا ہے خصوصاً انفیسائز اس بات پر کرنا ہے کہ زندگی کے وہ پہلو جو ہمارے اختیار میں ہیں جس میں کینیڈن گورنمنٹ نے ہمیں علاو کیا ہے کہ you can do whatever you want اب وہاں ہم اپنے شرعی قوانین کو یوز نہ کریں یہ خود جو ہے ایک گناہ ہے یعنی اگر ہمارے بعد کیا ہوتا ہے میرا میراس اگر غلط طریقے سے تقسیم ہو رہی ہے تو ایک لحاظ سے ہم بھی ذمہ دار ہیں کہ ہمارے پاس وہ طریقہ تھا وہ میکنیزم تھا کہ جس کے ذریعے ہم یہ گیرنٹی کم سے کم اپنی زندگی میں تو دل دے دیتے کہ جو کچھ ہمارے بعد ہو رہا ہے صحیح ہو رہا ہے تو یہ ایک ذمہ داری ہو جاتی ہے اس, اس ملک میں آنے کے بعد خصوصاً جب ہم دیکھتے ہیں کہ اینٹی اسلامک پروپاگنڈا بہت ہو رہا ہے اسپیشلی انہیریٹنس کے بارے میں یہ شریعہ لوگ کے خلاف جو کیمپین چلا تھا ٹورنٹو ہی میں اونٹاریو میں اور اس میں واقعا یہ ظالم ہیں جنہوں نے یہ سب حرکتیں کی تھی مسلمانوں کے خلاف یہاں تک کہ گورنمنٹ نے وہ جو بل پاس ہوئی تھی ارلی نائنٹیز میں اباؤٹ الٹرنیٹیو ڈسپیوٹ ریزولوشن کا جو ایکٹ تھا چونکہ مسلمان اس کو ایکسرسائز کرنا چاہ رہے تھے اور انہیں یہ بات پسند میں نہیں آئی تو وہ سب کے لیے بند کر دیا بجائے کہ وہ دروازہ ہمارے لیے بھی کھول دیتے ہیں 
वो सबके लिए उस दरवाजे को उन्होंने बंद कर दिया और उसमें एक बात यही थी कि भाई इनके यहां कानून देखो मुसलमानों में अगर कोई मर जाता है तो बेटे को डबल मिलता है बेटी को एक हिस्सा मिलता है बात वही है जो हमने अमीर उलमोमिन के खुतबे की बात की थी सिफिन में हमारे यहां हक जो है डजन एग्जिस्ट इन वैक्यूम हक जो है खला में नहीं है अगर एक तरफ हक की बात है तो दूसरी तरफ फर्ज की बात है और जो हक की डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन की बात होती है उसकी बुनियाद यही है इस्लाम बेसिकली क्या कहता है इस्लाम जिम्मेदारी को देखता है कि इस्लामी सिस्टम में मर्द पर फैमिली लाइफ में जिम्मेदारी और बोझ ज्यादा डाला गया है औरत पर बोझ कम है लिहाजा जब मीरास तकसीम होती है यानी वन जनरेशन से सेकेंड जनरेशन में जब दौलत की तकसीम होती है तो जहां बोझ ज्यादा है वहां हिस्सा भी ज्यादा मिलेगा जहां बोझ और जिम्मेदारी कम डाली गई है वहां उनको हिस्सा भी कम मिलेगा हां ये जनरल बात हो रही है मुमकिन आप कहें कि इट डजन अप्लाई इन एवरी सिचुएशन वहां पर वन थर्ड का कानून है कि अगर आप बाप के हैसियत है, है, से देखते हैं कि भाई बेटा जो है वेल टू डू है बेटी जो है बेटी और दामाद जो है जरा परेशान हाल है माल ये एतबार से आप हमेशा वो वन थर्ड में से जितना भी चाहें डाइवर्ट कर सकते हैं तो इस्लाम ने ये कानून भी बनाया है फ्लेक्सिबिलिटी भी रखी है ताकि इंसान अदल इंसाफ की बुनियाद पर काम करे यही मसला कि बेटों को दो हिस्से क्यों मिलते हैं बेटी को एक क्यों मिलता है एक शख्स था जिसका नाम था फह फकी ये इमाम है, इमाम है, इमाम हसन अस्करी आसलाम की खिदमत में आता है और यही इस क्वेश्चन उसने किया मा बाल अल मर आता खुजु सहमन वाहिदन व या खुजु रजुल सहमैन के मौला ये क्या वजह है कि औरत को एक शेर मिलता है और जो मर्द है उसको डबल मिलता है यानी बेटे और बेटी की बात हो रही है इमाम जवाब देते हैं इन अल मर अलई सा अलई है जहादुन वाला नफकतुन वाला अलई है मोकलतुन इन नवालिक अल रिजाल इमाम फरमाते हैं कि देखो इस्लाम में औरत से कुछ जिम्मेदारियों को उठा लिया गया है मसलन जहाद का मामला हो न सिर्फ फिजिकली जहाद करना बल्कि जहाद को फाइनेंस करने में भी औरत पर कोई बोझ नहीं है चाहे उसके पास दौलत भी हो शी डजन हैव टू गिव एनी थिंग जबकि मर्द पर यह जिम्मेदारी है नफका फैमिली को मेंटेन करना अगर बीवी जो है कमा भी रही है साहेब हैसियत है या मीरास मिली है उसको खानदान से तो उसके लिए जरूरी नहीं है कि वो खर्च करे अपने फैमिली के लिए ये हम मना नहीं कर रहे हैं हराम नहीं है भाई आप लोग घबराइए मत बात हो रही है हक फर्ज नहीं है उस पर वो अगर करती है तो अपनी मोहब्बत की बुनियाद पर करती है लेकिन उस पर यह फर्ज नहीं है यह बोझ नहीं डाला गया है नफका का और इसके अलावा भी जब लाइबिलिटीज की बात होती है उसमें भी मोकलत एक्चुअली एक यहां मिसाल है उस जमाने में बहुत होता था अरबों को सोसाइटी में कि अगर मसलन एक कबीले से किसी ने दूसरे कबीले को किसी आदमी को कत्ल कर दिया और अगर दूसरे कबीले वाले जो हैं उससे रिटालिएशन नहीं करना चाह रहे हैं बल्कि फाइनेंशियल कंपनसेशन मांग रहे हैं और उसके पास नहीं है तो पूरे घर वालों पर खानदान वालों पर वो बोझ आएगा लेकिन खातन जो हैं एग्जाम थे इससे जो मर्द हैं उनको देना पड़ेगा तो लाइबिलिटीज में भी औरतों को फ्री रखा गया है तो चूंकि माली एतबार से इकोनॉमिक इश्यूज में लाइबिलिटीज कम हैं मर्द की जिम्मेदारी और रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी ज्यादा है लिहाजा इमाम फरमाते हैं कि यहां जब इनहेरिटेंस की तकसीम होगी ज्यादा हिस्सा मर्द को मिलेगा कम मिलेगा बेटी को सलवार पढ़ने एक बार और तो ये शख्स जिसने ये सवाल किया था वो खुद रिवायत बयान करता है फकुल तो फिर नफसी कि जब हमने ये जवाब सुना तो मेरे दिमाग में ये बात आई कि कहीं और डिस्कशन हो रहा था तो किसी ने छठे इमाम के जमाने की बात की कि एक वहां एक शख्स था 
جس کا نام تھا ابن ابل اوجا اس نے یہی کوشچن چھٹے امام سے کیا تھا اور چھٹے امام نے جو جواب دیا تھا ایگزیکٹلی exactly وہی ہے جو انہوں نے ہمیں سامنے دیا ہے گیارہویں امام نے صرف اس کے دماغ میں یہ بات آئی تو پھر وہ کہتے ہیں کہ خود امام ہماری طرف دیکھا دے, دیکھتے ہیں اور پھر فرماتے ہیں نام حاد ہل مس اللہ مس ابن ابل اوجا اے فہفکی یہ جو سوال تم نے کیا ہے یہ وہی سوال ہے جو ابن ابل اوجا نے ہمارے جد سے کیا تھا والجواب من واحد یعنی امام نے اس کے ذہن کی بات کو سمجھ لیا یہ علم غیب کی جو بات ہوتی ہے کہ وہ ہمارے خیالات سے بھی واقف ہیں اور پھر امام کہتے ہیں والجواب من واحد تم ہم امام آئمہ اہل بیت سے جب تک سوال کرو گے تو جواب تمہیں ایک ہی ملے گا ادا خان مع المس واحد اگر ایک ہی کوشچن ہے تو جواب چاہے چھٹے امام سے پوچھو یا گیارہ میں امام سے پوچھو جواب تمہارے لیے ایک ہی ملے گا سلوات پڑھنے ایک بار اور پھر فرماتے ہیں وہ اجری علی آخر نا ما اجری علی اول نا کہ جو خدا وند عالم نے نعمت اور علم کو جاری کیا ہے جو ہمارے پہلے کے لیے کیا ہے وہ ہمارے آخر کے لیے بھی کیا ہے جو ہمیں علم مل رہا ہے جس سورس سے مل رہا ہے وہ سورس سب کے لیے برابر ہے اول انا و آخر انا فل علم و العمر سوا کہ ہمارے پہلے ہوں یا آخری ہوں علم کے اعتبار سے اور امر یعنی ہمارا جو حق ہے تم پر اس لحاظ سے سب برابر ہیں ولی رسول اللہ ولی امیر المؤمن فضل ہما ہاں رسول اور علی کا مرتبہ اور ان کی فضیلت اپنی جگہ پہ ہے لیکن علم جو خدا نے ان کو دیا ہے وہ ہمیں بھی دیا ہے سلوات پر میں ایک بار تو یہ بات ذہن میں رکھیں کہ یہ کوشچنز ہوتے ہیں مثلا اسلام کے انہیریٹنس لو کے بارے میں یہ کوئی نئی بات نہیں ہے صرف کوشش کرنی چاہیے کہ آئمہ کے علوم جو ہم تک پہنچے ہیں ان سے ان ٹچ رہیں تاکہ جو شبہات اور کوشچنز ابھرتے ہیں اس کا جواب ہمیں آئمہ ہی کے زبان سے اس زمانے کے کوشچنز کا جواب ہمیں مل سکتا ہے خدا وند عالم کی بارگاہ سے دعا ہے خدا وند اس قلیل بات قبول فرما ہمارے گناہوں کو بخش دے ہماری توفیقات میں اضافہ فرما اور ہمیں ان لوگوں میں سے قرار دے کہ جو یقیناً قرآن اور رسول اور اہل بیت کی پیروی کریں اور آخر وقت تک اسی صراط مستقیم پر ہمیں باقی رکھ امام کے ظہور میں تاجل فرما ربنا تقبل من کنت علیم